we are not going to be perfect every day, but what is our effort like? Like that's where I want their focus to be. We have to pull ourselves back to um, truth. I've worked really hard. I'm ready for this. You know, this is who I am. And that's where, that's always home base. I've never met anybody that's fearless. Like we gotta do it afraid, you know? Today's guest is a confidence coach with over 22 years of experience coaching some of the highest profile athletes, including 10 years at Michigan State, SMU, and the University of Miami. She now applies everything that she's learned working at the college, national, and Olympic levels to teach teams, athletes, women's organizations, and women in business how to handle those pressure to perform moments and build real confidence. So please help me in welcoming to the We Do Hard Things podcast, the confidence coach, Kristen Shevshunas. So you've been around um, a lot of different personalities, different different athletes at different levels. And so perhaps maybe you, you, you know you have a unique perspective on this, but um, how many people do you believe who've hit the level that they wanted to achieve? Did it through natural skill and natural talent versus, you know, just head down hard work and determination, which, which is more valuable. Like if you had to lean one way or the other, mm -hmm. I'm coming to you and I'm an athlete and I have one more of the other, which one would you rather me have? Well, I, I mean, certainly as a coach, I want hard work first. Like I want you to be a hard worker because that not only, you know, makes you better, but it makes the team better as well. But, you know, I come from the swimming world and I can't sit here and say, you know, Michael Phelps just worked harder than everybody right. else. Yeah, yeah, Cause he has, that he has is a bit true. Of an I mean, he's there. <laughs> yeah, there is, I mean, you know, one, one of my friends who's a three-time Olympian, like she just says that Olympians joke and they're like, um, when they talk about a non-Olympian, they call us mortals, you know? So <laughs> there's, I mean, certainly there has to be talent there, but at, certainly as a coach for 16 years, I'm going to want somebody who's going to work and have a great attitude and, you know, bring it, bring it every day. But you know, certainly the Olympians that you're watching, they, they've got both. <laughs> well, I guess maybe here's another way to ask it. If, if, if at a certain point somebody lets themselves down, is it because they're bumping up against their skill level or because they, their willpower or their, their belief, confidence or whatever lets them down? Yeah, it's, it's almost always the confidence piece. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because I do work with a lot of professional athletes and athletes that are not supposed to get better as they get older, right? They're supposed to be like, they're supposed to hit their peak, you know, when, when they're younger. But what I always say is, you know, they have been doing the, the physical work for so, for so long. They're, you know, they're so good. They're so strong. They have so much, we call it money in the bank, right? They put so much money in the bank with all that hard work and they've done nothing mentally. They've done nothing with their confidence. But when we start working together, these older women, like I said, that shouldn't be hitting their peak. Once they start working the confidence and these two pieces come together, that's when you're able to hit your potential. And so you, you've like really... Um, dedicated your life to confidence. I mean, I imagine you get tired of being asked questions about it or whatever. And, I, I actually love, you know, I love talking about it. Even if I'm not looking forward to it, I end up getting all pumped up. And <laughs> Have you always been super, super athletic and determined and confident? <laughs> Well, athletic, um, I was a swimmer. So, you know, in the water, I was good, but I wouldn't call myself athletic on land. <laughs> um, and no, I wasn't always determined. Um, I luckily ended up being pretty talented in swimming when I started, but I was also, I, I didn't work very hard. And um, I believe it was my junior year of high school that my brother pretty much 
cussed me out and said, um, cause he swam too. And he just didn't have like, he wasn't as good as me. And he cussed me out and he's like, can you imagine how good you would be, you know, if you actually worked hard and I don't know, you know, my brother is like, he's everything to me. And every time he s- says something, it always, you know, hits me deep and it just, it hit me deep. And, um, from that day forward, I just started working really hard. And then when it was time for, cause I come from a really small town, um, very little, training you know i wasn't training at an elite level by any you know stretch of the imagination so when it came to college um that determination was still there and but i wasn't really good enough to go d1 but i also knew that if i put myself in an elite training group you know that i could possibly reach my potential so i actually walked on at the university of tennessee and then worked my way up, you know, with scholarship and stuff like that. So that junior year in high school is when I became the very determined woman that I am today, for sure. Well, I, I think, I think that's awesome. And, and digging into obviously your, your content and um, the different, the different, the different um, uh, lectures that you give and everything else. What, what I kind of see uh, is someone, you know, who you like, you almost, I, I almost perceive or you speak with like, like such an authority, like, like, a, like a military, like, or like a, like a disciplined type way of carrying yourself and speaking. And so I was curious if that's like been crafted over the years, or if literally you're like an eight year old, who's like, <laughs> this is what we do. And this is how we do it. Let's go. <laughs> like, um, I suspect it's probably been crafted along, you know, along the way. And certainly when I started coaching, um, you know, I learned that. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I have two sides of me because I do have that, you know, that harsh side. But then I also, you know, the main thing that I do is one-on-one with people. And so, you know, I, I'm also this you know, relater and um, show empathy and kindness. And, you know, so I have that side of me too. But then, you know, I'm also the type of person um, I'm going, going to speak truth, but I also know they're not going to listen unless I have a relationship with them. So um, all of that adds into it for sure. So, so part of, I mean, the main reason why I wanted to speak with you is, is hopefully to learn something from you as well. But, you know, I, I, I believe that, that um, doubt, that fear, um, and it's either the doubt that has, been, that has been embedded into us because of the things people say or the looks people give or those little moments when you're growing up that you just tell yourself, well, that's for others. You know, like, I, I'm not built this way. I don't have that skill. I can't do that. And so the fear and the doubt keeps us from becoming the people we need to be. Um, and so part of why I was asking about that is, is I, was, I was curious. I'm curious because I'm kind of a, a soft guy, you know, like I've, I've, um, I've never really been athletic. I've never really been that competitive. I've never really been that A-type. I'm pretty black and white. I'm pretty direct. But, you know, I, I don't have just that like hunger, desire to go out there and, you know, and, and do whatever it takes to make it happen. And so I'm always curious if, if it's just determined people are determined and will always be determined and those who aren't aren't or if people like me can cross over to fight the fear to fight the doubt to build the confidence to do the things and and whether you've been able to see that happen in your experience yeah i mean i think there's certainly something to a personality there's there's no doubt about that because you know i work with some of the best athletes in the world and some are like uh, driven and some are just chill, you know, and, and laid back. So certainly it is, you know, a, a personality thing, part of it. But with the fear and doubts, um, what I've learned about fear is that everyone experiences it, even the Olympians. Um, but everyone also thinks they're the only one experiencing it. And, and when we feel like we're the only one, we, we wonder what is wrong with me. 
And I'm such a big believer that when we feel like something is wrong with us, our confidence just gets lower and lower and lower. So I am very, very big. I mean, when I speak, part of, um, part of my content is sharing the fears that the top athletes in the world have because so many people think, oh gosh, you know, they're so fearless. I wish that I could have no doubts and be fearless like them. And it's a crock because they're struggling with the same stuff, but they're also learning, you know, how to handle those fears when they do come so they can move, you know, forward from them. So I'm very big in, you know, it, I'm a big believer that confidence comes when you have nothing left to hide. And so mm -hmm. often when we're afraid and, you know, we, we're afraid we're the only one, we won't talk about it. And so we just hide it, hide it, hide it. And I don't believe you can be confident when you're hiding, you know, stuff like that. I always say it becomes almost like an anchor in us and we go to take a step forward into our potential and we can't move. But when we start getting honest, you know, and, and get rid of all that junk, you know, fear, shame, you know, all of that stuff. Once we get it out and, you know, the anchor goes away, then we can start, you know, really taking mm. steps toward our potential. Mm. Now, I know, I know that you mainly focus most of your, your work with women. Um, you know, I, I think that, that honestly, maybe men have done a better job of hiding a lack of confidence <laughs> or whatever it might be. But, yeah. you know, my wife and I, we've been together uh, 20 years now. Um, we met in high school and we have kids who are hitting teenage years. And so it's funny, the other day we were talking about um, just, just being a teenager and pining for someone who, to love you. A song came on and went, oh, this song reminds me of back when I was this age. And, and oh man, just, just I so desperately wanted a girlfriend. And my wife's like, yeah, but girls so desperately want a boyfriend. And I was like, yeah, but but, but guys aren't supposed to, you know, admit that or want that or whatever it is, right? Like, you know, you have your guy thing and you've got to be a certain way and women have to be a certain way and whatnot. Is this not a universal thing? Or do you, or do you believe that, that because of societal um, and, and, and um, gender-based stereotypes, conditioning and other things that, that this does more greatly affect women in terms of a lack of confidence, a lack of belief and so on versus men? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I'll go back to that um, statement of when we wonder what is wrong with me, our confidence gets lower and lower. And, you know, if you look at our culture, if you look at any commercial on TV or advertisement, pretty much their job is to make us feel like something is wrong with us. So, you know, we buy their product. And certainly, you know, media and stuff like that is is catered. Commercials are catered toward toward women. Um, you know, when you're looking in magazines and, and, you know, and certainly comparing, I've, I've learned, it's so strange because comparing is, I don't know a woman that doesn't compare. Um, men, I, I don't know, because I kind of get different answers, you know, from, from different men. But what I do realize is that as a woman, when we do compare ourselves to another woman, it's almost as if that woman is taking something away from us. Like mm. if I feel pretty, but I see somebody prettier, suddenly I don't feel pretty. Like we both can't be pretty, you know, kind of thing. Um, you know, and it happens at athletics all the time. Oh, I went, you know, I did so well. Oh, somebody did better. Oh man, I suck. You know, it's just the strangest thing when we- That's So interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that when so we, um, com it, it, it's, it's so funny because every time I talk about comparing, I said men, you know, when I talk about it, I'm like, men are like, what in the world are you talking about? But every woman in the room knows exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. And My I believe that that also leads to, you know, I mean, it, there's a stereotype out there, women don't get along. And I believe that a lot of the reason that we don't get along is because of comparing you're taking something away from me and I'm mad at you, even though you're not take, you know, you feel like they're taking something away from you, but they're actually not. Yeah. yeah my, my wife and I had this exact thing 
well, gosh, maybe a year ago now, we were at an event, we were at an event and we met someone who happens to go to the same gym as us. And so I was talking about, oh, you know, that was a really hard workout. And what are you doing? And what, you know, what are your road times? What are your run times? And we're talking about stuff. And my wife had an injury at the time and was in physio. So she wasn't operating at her best. And after the conversation, she was so upset and angry. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm just talking to this person. I have my numbers. She has her numbers. You have your numbers. Like, you know, we all like, this isn't a competition. <laughs> We're built differently. We're different people. What are you talking about? And she felt like so left out and embarrassed and not good enough and all of this stuff. And I like, literally until you said that, I've been scratching my head for a year about this because yeah. I just don't understand it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. And then um, Glennon Doyle, who's, you know, one of my favorite authors, she wrote Untamed, she talked about even, you know, because women, you know, we are desperate to have a seat at the table that's filled with men, but so often we get one seat. And so to, if you get that seat, you're going to do everything you can to keep that seat, you know, and not let other women. So even with helping each other and things like that, um, you know, it's, it's a little different on the women's side. <laughs> and, and so, you know, if, if I'm someone who has, so I can think of the, the women in my life and I, I was raised by very, very strong women. I, I, I love, um, you know, speaking with, and my wife is a very strong woman as well. Uh, but, you know, I've got two daughters. Um, I think of the women in my life. Um, and so what is step one for, for, for those people or for anyone who we know that we're carrying this doubt, this lack of belief. Um, we have the dreams, we have the hopes, we have the plans, but year after year goes by because, because we're, we're just waiting for the moment where we're old enough to say, Oh, I guess, you know, I guess I'm never going to do this or I guess I can't or whatever it is. What's step one. Well, I think, you know, I always say, it, it, especially when it comes to sports, because there are all these, you know, do this, do that, do this, you know, kind of thing to help with your fear. But the problem is we're just putting band-aids on a huge wound. We're not getting to what's actually causing the fear. And I am such a big believer. I just call it wake up. Like we need to start you know, knowing, you know, if I'm talking to an athlete, oh, I'm having a lot of anxiety, you know, a lot of fear before my competitions. Well, what's going through your mind? I don't know. Um, well, you need to know because if you don't know, you can't fix it. So mm -hmm. I am such a huge believer, like all my clients, I mean, first day um, after we talk, their homework is write down because I call them the what ifs because most often, you know, it, it's the unknown. A what if, when a what if pops into our mind, it almost always goes worst case scenario. So um, what are those what ifs that are making you go, whoa, no, never mind, the risk is too great? Because if we don't know what they are, we can't conquer them. So certainly we need to know what is going through your mind, you know, when you have these goals and things like that, and you want to take a step, what is seriously going through your mind that makes you take a step back and go, no, never mind, the risk has just become too big. We need to make sure that we um, know what they are so we can be prepared for them. Because again, I'm also a big believer. I, I, I don't, I've never met anybody that's fearless, like we got to do it afraid, you know? So um, we got to know what those fears are because I believe they're going to come every time that we're under pressure, when we're feeling the pressure to perform. Um, so know what they are and just own it. Because again, let's stop hiding. Let's stop pretending. When we can be our true authentic selves, yeah, I'm afraid and it's okay. You know, really owning it and knowing what they are is is you know, the first few steps. Well, and, and in, in, you know, one of the videos on your website, you, you mentioned that line, you know, like if you're looking to be fearless, you know, that's, that's not going to happen. Hate to break it to you. And yeah. I was like, Oh gosh, because, <laughs> because, you know, um, I have anxiety. And so I want to be the person who doesn't have anxiety. Um, I have fear. I have doubt. Um, I question, do I have it? Can I do it? Um, will I screw up? 
like all of these normal human feelings. But, but sure. I've been holding on for the last few years to the point where through enough self-awareness, through enough progression, through enough work, that I'll be able to put all that stuff behind me. And I keep bumping up against it. And I keep going like, haven't, haven't I hit the point where I don't have to deal with this stuff anymore? And all my <laughs> yeah. friends and stuff go like, no, you're going to work on this forever. Yeah. Right. And it's like, I don't want to work on it forever. I want to beat yeah. this. Yeah. So I yeah. imagine your athletes feel the same way, don't they? Oh, sure. Sure. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, when I start working with an athlete, when they write down their what ifs, I mean, as they go through things and as they go through their career, they change. So, I mean, let me say there are some that are just constants, right? We know, we know which one is going to plague us every single time, but then, you know, some other ones they can, you know, they can change as, as you move through life, as you go through your journey. But I think the main thing is we're waiting for easy and we just need to understand it ain't going to be easy. You know, if we are going to take a risk and do something extraordinary that is never going to be easy. Like we've got to, you know, um, understand that the fear is going to be there and it's going to be hard, but we can do it. So I, I'm making a, a, a leap here, but if you're so dedicated to confidence, is it because you had a lack of confidence at some point in your life and, and you've unlocked something that you can oh, share? Yeah. Well, you know, in college, I took that big risk, you know, and walked on at the University of Tennessee and freshman year, like I got better, but it wasn't anywhere near where I wanted to be. And then my sophomore year, I started to get, you know, really good. And I was one of the top swimmers on the team and then um, did terribly the end of my sophomore year. And then junior year kind of picked up where I was and started killing it. And then had a terrible junior year uh, end, you know, the end of swimming season, you know, that's where you're supposed to be at your best. <clears throat> and now I can look back and see, like, when you finally get to a point of where you've always dreamed of being, you know, there's really two, two ways to deal with it. You can be like, hell yeah, I'm excited. You know, I'm finally where I want to be. It scared the bejesus out of me. Like it, it's, I come from a home of a lot of fear. My mom is very, very fearful, un, you know, doesn't trust anybody kind of person. And that, um, it stopped me. Like I was never good again after, after that, because I was just the pressure of being good. And just the, 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 what if, what if, what if, what if, um, it ruined, it ruined me. So certainly that adds fuel um, to my fire. But what really changed me was um, counseling. I did counseling um, back, God, could it be eight, eight years ago now. Um, but that's where, because I also, you want to talk about holding stuff in and hiding. That was my whole life. I mean, I, um, gosh, I was just hiding so much and just being able to have a safe space to finally talk and get those anchors, you know, out of me, it completely changed my life. You know, I say confidence is when you have nothing left to hide. It's because, you know, I acted like I was confident. You know, I was a division one head coach. I walked around, you would have thought I was, you know, this powerful, confident woman. No, I struggled, you know, so bad. I had so many doubts. I had so many fears. Um, but it was, you know, when I got rid of it all and I, and I spoke my truth hmm. um, and got rid of those anchors and had nothing left to hide, that is when I realized what real confidence is. Do, do you find that most people build themselves into a trap like that? I mean, you know, you have a goal and you're working and, and, and you hit certain levels, even the athletes you're working with, they have dreams, they get certain levels and then they feel trapped or boxed in by the very thing that they've been working towards for so long. Yeah. Because, you know, getting good, you know, being good is really fun, but there is so much pressure and there's so much expectation from you? And what if I don't meet that expectation? What if I fail everybody? You know, I mean, I don't know an Olympian 
um, that when I ask them what their what ifs are, it's like, what if I embarrass myself in front of millions of people? Um, so it, certainly those expectations from others can wreck people's confidence. Yeah. I mean, I think we could probably rhyme it off. It's like, I'm going to make a fool of myself. I'm, I'm going to try and then realize I can't do it and then feel stupid for even thinking I could try to do it. Sure. Um, I'm going to embarrass my, my friends and family who spend so much time and money and effort trying to get me there and all of this stuff. I'm going to let you down. I'm going to let America down, whatever it is. Right. Um, you know, I, these, these are all the same doubts that we all face. So, so what yeah. is the, what I, you know, I, I, I don't know why, but when you were thinking, when you were saying that I thought of summer Olympics a bunch of years ago where, you know, athlete is working towards, I think it was like hurdles or something. And it was like the first hurdle of their race. They were supposed to win a gold. It was going to be the greatest thing. They were the greatest athlete ever. And they wipe out and it's like, it's over. It's it. It's done. And what an embarrassing and terrible moment. And so that's like, we're all thinking that's going to happen to us. Like the world is going to crumble around us because we're going to screw up. So we get our what ifs down. Is there, is there a next step to make, to make us feel better? Yeah. I mean, you know, for me, I'm, I'm such a big believer that in those times of fear, like home base, where we always need to pull ourselves back to is truth. Um, Like we have got to get back to, because, you know, the what if with worst case scenario attached, like we're out in the, in the future, like we're out seeing ourselves, you know, fall on that hurdle. We're seeing ourselves, you know, disappoint everybody. We're out in the future. I'm such a big believer. Let's pull ourselves back to right now. Like, what do I know? What is truth, you know, right now? And that's, you know, I don't know um, if you've seen, but I, you know, I have these bracelets, um, confidence nuggets bracelets, and they are just little, there's like 25 different ones and they all represent a truth that we so often forget in times of pressure and in times of fear. So, you know, I am, I mean, I've had people, you know, before job interviews, you know, when they're freaking out, be able to look down at their wrist and be like, wait, I'm courageous. You know, I, I can do this. I, so I'm just such a big believer. Um, we have to pull ourselves back to um, truth. I've worked really hard. I'm ready for this. You know, this is who I am. And that's where, that's always home base. I'm always going to pull back to truth because I'm also a big believer. You know, we're going to go there. We're going to go to the negative. We're going to go to the worst case scenario. We are going there. We don't have to beat ourselves up about it. We don't have to think we're weak because we're there, but we just need to know that we can't stay there. And so when we find ourselves there, it's all about pulling ourselves back to home base, pulling ourselves back to the truth. Hmm. I appreciate you sharing that. I I do know that you said, you know, the first thing to go out the window is uh, that you need to get back is the confidence, the perspective and truth. And I, and I was, I was curious what, what you meant by that. Um, How do you, how, how do you, so, so is it that, you reground yourself in truth, which helps you pull back and, and get a little bit more perspective that eventually builds confidence? Or is there, is there an order or, or a way to help linear people like me think through like, okay, A, B, C, D, perfect, I can get there? Yeah, so I challenge all my athletes um, to keep a confidence journal. And so after every workout, they, because here's the deal. Here's, here's what I see with people is, you know, we can do 99 things right and one thing wrong. And we're walking out thinking about the one thing wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and when we actually do something well, it's not good enough, you know? So when we get to a competition or we get to that pressure moment, um, we need to feel prepared. But if we're only paying attention to the bad stuff, you know, the things we're doing wrong, and we're not giving ourselves any sort of credit because it's never good enough, there's no way we're going to feel prepared. And so every one of my athletes keeps a confidence journal. There's two reasons. Number one is because I believe we need to train our brain to start looking at the good stuff that we're doing because we're not. 
we're paying attention to that one thing. We're, these athletes are walking out. They can have the greatest practice, but if they have a bad last set or something or a bad last play, they're walking out thinking, you know, about that. So having a journal and saying, you know, I challenge them in the beginning, write at least one thing down that you did well in practice. And then when you start to think about it, it starts to like train your brain to look for those good things because we are not going to be perfect every day. But what is our effort like? Like that's where I want, you know, their, um, their focus to be not necessarily, and especially in the swimming world, times, 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 times. You are not going to be fast every day. You're just not. So, you know, if you walk out of practice every time your times aren't there and think what a waste of time, you're getting better physically, but you're not getting better mentally. So let's focus in on your effort and give yourself credit for it. Like, what did you do well? And suddenly you're finding, oh, there's a lot of things, you know, that I did well. And the second part of why that confidence journal is because to be able to look back on it before your pressure situation, before, you know, a big competition, to look back on it, to remind yourself, oh my gosh, I have worked really hard. Because what if I'm not prepared is one of the big ones. And that is just proof that you are. Mm. Because it is in your face, like you can't deny it. Like I've, I've done this work and it's just such a reminder of, hey, you know, I can sit here and say I'm not prepared, but this proves otherwise. So I'm going to go ahead and stick with truth right here. I used to be a competitive swimmer. And when I say oh. that, I realize that I usually say that to people who don't know anything about it. Um, but I only did it for three years. So when I'm talking okay. to you, it's like, you know, I think I did it from seven, the age of seven to 10 or something. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, I used to love the practices. I used to hate the meets. It was just... Because um, yeah. the pressure? No, I don't know. Not knowing what to do or this or that uh, or, you know, like yeah. you know, whatever, you're a little kid. But um, but but I, I'm curious if if you found that there's a combination of the things that happen in the pool, of the things that happen, you know, in in the home life, and then the things that happen in preparation where there's like really a good formula for like, you know, whether this is business, whether this is competition, no matter what it is, it can't just be the stuff that happens the day of. You know, there's prep work, there's there's constant things. How, how much focus do you kind of set up on, on each of these things to get the most out of, out of uh, the moment? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as I say, like life outside of sport affects sport. So it's not just a, you know, day of competition. It's not just at practice. It's not just in the weight room. But, you know, um, it's funny because when I was coaching at Miami, I would give – um, toward the end, I would, um, that's how I fell in love with confidence coaching because I started doing it with them. I would give them like an hour a week where they could come in and it was just a safe space, you know, to really come in and, and talk about life and just get it out. Um, some days it was a five minute check-in. Some days it was an hour of crying and Kleenex and, you know, getting it all out. But I always joke because here I am, the head, the head swim coach talking to swimmers and probably 15% of what we actually taught was swimming. Everything else was life outside of sport. So I'm such a huge believer that we need to make sure we are keeping balance, keeping our mental health, you know, staying mentally healthy um, outside, you know, of, of sport as well, because that certainly adds to um, confidence. I mean, it is, it will 100% affect, um, it doesn't matter how prepared, how strong, how confident an athlete is. If their life outside of this outside of sport is a wreck, they're, they're not reaching their full potential. Hmm. And so what, what I, um, what I'm, what I love, what I'm hoping, you know, we've, we've talked about some basic things, you know, getting into basic things, but you don't work with basic people, right? Like you're, you're working with next level people who are looking for the advanced classes. So, 
So once, once, you know, obviously by the time people hate you, they, they've already come up, you know, they've, they've been raised in it. They've come up in it. They know they're dedicated to it. This is what they want to do. They have their own whys. They have their own reasons for doing it. Sure. We bump up against all of the fear and the things that you, you've kind of been talking about, but um, is it that, the, um, the, the fears I'm bumping up against when I'm hitting that, that top level and the lack of confidence that I have in myself and my doubt and my anxiety, are, are the tools for solving that exactly the same for the people who are way lower down doing much easier things? Or does it start to ramp up to like, like really like next level genius ways of, of, of cracking these things? Um, I think it's all very basic. I think it is, it is, um, what I'm talking about is sounds so simple, but it is hard because nobody can do it for you. Like you have to take 100% responsibility to know where you are, know what those, what is, you know, know when you're in the deep end, you know, freaking out. And when you know, Hey, I have to get back to home base or I need to get, you know, into the shallow end, like, the, the hardest part is we want, again, we want it to be easy and we want help. I can, I can give you the tools. I can't make you use them, you know? So I think that um, it's very, very simple if you look at it on paper, but it's very, very, you know, it, it's hard. And, and let me say, you know, I always say, because a lot of times I'll, I'll get a, God, I wish I could just be confident like I was when I was young, right? <laughs> and, and what I always say is, um, when you're young and you haven't gone through failure yet, or at least very many failures, there's really not a whole lot to be afraid of. But then when you go through your first failure, what enters the equation after that is what if it happens again, which just can paralyze us. And so certainly as we go on and, and, you know, we know the longer you do this, like the more failures you're going to have, cause you can't get to success without the failures. What if it happens again? What if it happens again? What if it happens again? It certainly weighs down. I always use the example of Missy Franklin in 2012. Um, you know, she was 17. She was breaking world records. She was winning all kinds of gold medals. She had had very little failure in her career. She was just a happy, like, what's there to be afraid of, you know, because everything had gone right. And then 2016 happens, where if those out there that don't know anything about swimming, she failed, you know, what if I embarrass myself in front of millions of people? Like, that's what she did. I mean, she, you know, admits that, like, it was mortifying for her. Everything was off. Um, the fear after that. I mean, you know, when I asked her to write down her <laughs> what ifs, I mean, I, I got a few pages worth. Where had I asked her at 17, oh, you know, what if I get silver instead of gold or, you know, <laughs> something so innocent, you right. know, because there's just nothing to be afraid of. But again, you know, after failure, the fear can be paralyzing. And so certainly there's um, so much more, um, it gets harder to do those simple things that I was talking about earlier and getting back to truth. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's a bit harder as you go along and the more that you fail, but again, you can't get to success without failure. So it's. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've heard, um, I can't recall who says it, but I, I've heard people talk about leadership where it's really easy to be a leader when things are going well, but the true right? mark of a leader is someone who can actually take something that's like, like they call it a U-turn leader. Some, some, something that's going down can be stopped and corrected. That's leadership. Leadership when it's, when it's going well is easy. Leadership when you just burn it to the ground. Well, you've done that. Um, yeah. But that turnaround is, so, so in, an, in an example like you just gave, where it's like things are going well, things are going well, um, suddenly they're not going well. I mean, that, that turnaround is, is I mean, it's, it's the foundation for every, every movie, every story that we love. You know, the, the person who, who faced sure. 
ridiculous amounts of setbacks and then overcomes it. It makes us all feel good. But what's the prescriptive approach to being able to get through that? Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I think it is, um, just understanding it's, it's, there's never going to be easy after that. (laughs) Um, understand you're not going to be fearless, but you do need to be brave. Um, risking failure is really scary stuff. I mean, it is just really, really scary because, you know, again, we're not just worried about what other people think if we fail, but we also think it defines us, you know, does this mean something about me that I keep failing? So I think that after a a few failures, people are like, done, I must not have what it takes, not realizing that maybe on the other side of that last failure, that's where the success, you know, can come. Because I do believe if you keep working hard, you know, I do believe that you will get there. But some people are going to have one or two failures. Some people are going to have 15 before, you know, before they get there. It's just kind of a, um, you know, and, and how do you keep going for me? Um, you know, it's, it's what I do. It's, it's giving these people a space to a, a safe space where they can come in and, and speak out their feelings and speak out their frustrations and speak out, you know, how disappointed they are and how upset they are because, you know, I allow everybody to be real, but then, okay, how do we get ourselves back to what's the truth? Who am I? I do have the strength to keep going. You know, so I don't think that um, you can get there alone. I do think, um, and I don't think that you can get there when you keep just shoving it down, shoving it down. I'm going to hide all of all of this because at some point, you know, the anchor is going to stop you. So big believer, like, let's speak it out. You know, when I talk to parents, that's one of the main things after failure. Do not let your child, you know, like... Don't think, oh, they're already embarrassed. I don't want to, you know, upset them by talking about it. Talk about it. Because mm-hmm. if they take that failure and just, I'm just not going to talk about it. I'm going to pretend it didn't happen or just try to move on from it. That is just adding to the anchor. So it's really creating, you know, finding somebody that you can speak your truth to and, and say, man, that was really upsetting. And I'm so disappointed and I wanted that so bad and cry and get it, you know, get it all out and then get back to truth and, and start again. In, in, in your experience, if some, if something, I imagine there's a moment where you look at someone and they may not have realized that it's over yet, but you know, it's over. Um, I, they, they've, they've given up or luck has gone against them or, or they're just not doing what they, they need to do. Like what's the most disappointing thing that someone can do in your mind as you're watching them, right? You, you said that you can't, you can give them the tools, but you can't do the, the caring for them, the thinking for them, the hard work for them or whatever it is. What, what is the, what is the most disappointing thing for you? I want to know so I can avoid it. <laughs> well, no, I just think that, you know, you, I, I've seen it, you know, when somebody's kind of done or close, close to done is, you know, when you're making commitments and you're not following through, um, that is such a, because, you know, we need to, to feel confident, we need to feel accomplished. And if you are making, you know, um, I I need to do this, this, and this, and then you're not doing it, you're finishing the day not feeling accomplished. So, you know, it's something as easy as one of the Olympians, she's a two-time Olympian that I work with, and and she's struggling with this. And um, she wanted to be held accountable for something. And so every night at nine o'clock, I'm get, I get a text from her, like letting me know that she did it because she just needs, you know, that accountability. So I think 
um, when people aren't reaching out for accountability and they've just kind of given up on themselves and they're not feeling like they're accomplishing anything, that's usually, um, I don't, I'm not, you know, the only one feeling disappointed in them. They're feeling disappointed in themselves too. Yeah. Um, cause I think, you know, finish it out, you know, find, find a way, find a way to finish and, and finish well. Um, because as a 45 year old woman, I know when you don't, you're going to look back on that and you're not going to be, you're not going to be proud. Hmm. This might be a really small thing, but I, I have this, this wristband on, this is a Tony Robbins unleash the power within wristband. Okay. I attended it a year ago, July. <laughs> and when I, when I left it a year ago, July, I said, I am not cutting this thing off until I hit my, um, like my weight goal and my body percentage of that goal. And, and so, um, I got really close. I got to half a pound within my goal. Oh, wow. And then, um, and then honestly, I, so, so you, you, you know, you don't know my story at all, but I, I used to be 50 pounds heavier, never athletic, never competitive. Um, I've lost weight. I've gotten into it, but, but I, I don't know anything about any of this stuff. And so I didn't realize So I was doing lots and lots of cardio and I was able to cut my weight, got half a pound within, but then I was doing lift. I was lifting too, as part of my training. And so I gained a lot of muscle mass. Yeah. So even though I looked good, I, I started moving further away from my goal. And so my son a few weeks ago said, said, you know, like dad, like if you just focus on this, you know, I'm only whatever, six pounds away now. If you focus on it and you fast and you do all the things that you need to do, you'll get it off in like two weeks. And I was like, you know what, son, you're right. I will do that. I, I will. Anyway, I was, I was thinking this morning as I was running on the treadmill, I was like, I'm not any closer to my goal. It's been a year. I don't know why this doesn't bother me. Like this, this would be like the most burning thing in my life to get this stupid thing cut off. And yet I think I've just become like, just, just, just apathetic towards it. It's like, you know, I'm healthy. I exercise. So what if I'm not like, do you find that the people that you're working with are just, just have that constant determination all the time or oh, no. like me where they're just like in and out and oh, all over yeah. the place. Oh, it, it it's a yo-yo. And, and, and I think that that's another thing that people think that these Olympians are just like, I can't wait to get to practice and I'm going to kill it. And I'm going to, and it's like, that is not like that at all. I mean, there are days where it's just like, they are struggling. They're struggling to get out of bed too, you know, but they get, they get out of bed. Um, So, you know, I, I think when it comes to goals, you know, I don't know anybody that hasn't edited you know, edited (laughs) along, along the way. I mean, because think about it, you know, you're sitting here and you, you're probably a half a pound, but you're healthier than you've ever been. You're stronger than you've ever been like that. That to me is uh, okay. We're going to edit that because I'm proud of, of what I've done here. And if I have muscle, like how am I going to be that light? (laughs) feels like cheating. It's like, I said I was going to do this. So I'm going to do it even if it takes me years, but, and I, I don't know why, you know, like, I, I guess I'd maybe, I need to want it bad more, more badly because I should, I mean, six pounds is nothing. You can lose six pounds pretty easily. Right. <laughs> Men so. can. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hear that from my wife and her friends all the time. <laughs> unfair that, you know, men can do this or they can do that or whatever it is. But, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so the last thing that I really wanted to touch on was, um, and maybe this is taking a bit of a step back and I apologize, but you know, one thing that I really loved that you also said was, you know, when you're facing that big moment, right. You know, all of, all of your preparation and all of your training and all of that stuff goes out and can go out the window, you know, and the fear and the doubt shows up and everything just kind of splits. I've, I've heard, you know, it said that, um, you know, Tiger Woods dad, for example, worked him as a two-year-old and a three-year-old and a four-year-old. So that way when he was on the green, like it was just like second nature to just go through the motions is there, is there re, like, is there a prep or is there something we can do? Because I think of the hard things that come along that we have to face aren't the repetitive tasks because we get used to them. They're the things that 
catch us off guard, the things that surprise us, the, 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 you know, the, the, big, the big moments that you know, are kind of out of our control sometimes. Are there things that we can or should be doing to be able to prep for that so it's not so life-shattering <laughs> when we're facing Well, you know, you said, you know, with Tiger, um, you know, I am very big in routine. And, and the reason, and honestly, this has just become part of what I talk about in the last probably two years, um, because what I've seen is these people walking into competitions ready and they are um, feeling good and they're feeling confident. But then when the pressure hits, you know, the confidence seems to go and suddenly they'll start looking around at what other people are doing. Well, so-and-so is doing this. Should I do this? Well, so-and-so is doing this. Should I do this? And I'm like, do you usually do that at competitions? Mm. No, but, and I'm like, okay, you need to create a routine for you that, that, you know, works best for you and then stick with it. And I say, that's almost like it's dropping breadcrumbs with your routine because when you panic, your brain shuts down, you know, and like I said, athletes are doing things they've never done at a competition before, you know, at the biggest competition of their life, they start doing new stuff. I'm like, what are you doing? But you just, you panic and your brain stops. So like having a routine, okay, my brain is not functioning right now, but I do know my routine and I'm going to go through it because I know that this is what is going to prepare me most for this moment. So certainly, um, I think coming up with a routine that when the panic and fear and doubts hit, you still like second nature know exactly what you need to do. And, and so the, the only other thing that, that, I, that, I, that I struggle with, but I can think of is, do most people not feel shame or guilt for feeling what they feel, right? Like, so like, like I'm, I'm panicking right now. I shouldn't be panicking, right? Real athletes don't panic. Real athletes are prepped. What am I like? And you know, I have anxiety, so it's it's not even the anxiety; it's the anxiety about the anxiety that, yeah. that tends to be the biggest challenge. Yeah. Um, is is that is that pretty common? And is the answer? Oh just gosh, to be yeah. like I mean, just to be like, hey, get used to it. <laughs> well, that, that that's the main thing, and that's why I'm so big on sharing. You know. Um, sharing these fears and stuff like that. When I speak, you know, the top fears that I hear because, you know, I want people to understand like you're, you're not alone and, and you don't have to beat yourself up. You don't have to feel weak. You don't have to feel like you're not mentally tough just because you're afraid, you know, but we also have to do something about it. We can't, again, you're going to go there. Don't feel bad about it. Don't beat yourself up. You just can't stay there. So it's, you know, the best are, they're all going there. The best are coming back to, okay, wait, let me, let me remember my truth in this moment. What an encouraging interview. Okay. Three takeaways for me. Number one, don't compare your accomplishments with others because even the best athletes have their own fears. Number two, you need to know what you fear in order to overcome it. That's huge, right? And number three, you must not only face your failures, but you also have to talk about them with someone who's there to help you. Listen, living in fear, listening to the haters, the voice of doubt in your head, it will keep you standing still and standing still is death. So you have to keep moving. And to do so, you've got to think big. You've got to be bold and you must say yes. If you need more Next Level Conversations, you have got to watch the one the only Iron Cowboy. Click on the link right over there. I'll see you there. On to, to gratitude and the things that we get to do. I don't have to go on a 140 mile bike ride. I don't have to do Eco Challenge. I get to do those things. Changes the mindset when you're out there suffering.